afternoon or it is now. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, everybody's here for MemCache, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, if, if you're here for APC, that's the next room over. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, welcome back for lunch. Hope everybody's having a good uh, weekend. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. So uh, my name is Sean Smiley. I'm one of the lead engineers at Achieve Internet. We uh, specialize in building high-performance uh, websites for enterprises. And one of the key components of uh, building a high-performance website is uh, using memcache as a caching layer in your system. And so this presentation is really going to be going into a little bit of the nuts and bolts behind how you use memcache. And uh, we're not going to be talking a whole lot about the other aspects of a caching and high-performance strategy. I re really wanted this session to focus on just this one particular slice of it because there's plenty of other great sessions here at SANCAMP on the overall performance strategy. So first of all, does everybody here know what memcache is? Or, and have, how many of you actually used it? <laughs> okay, a few. So we're going to briefly touch on what exactly is memcache and what components do you need to get installed to, to use it properly. Then why you should use it and how do you know it's working. Uh, we'll look at some of its limitations and configuration options. Uh, a little bit of troublesh basic troubleshooting techniques uh, so you can figure out if you're not getting ca the cache results you're expecting, how can you diagnose that information. Uh, then we're going to look at uh, three basic configuration strategies for different types of uh, uh, system setups. And we're just going to wrap, wrap everything up with uh, just a few general purpose tips on, uh, on how to get the most out of, out of your memcache installation. So uh, feel free to interrupt me with questions at any time. Um, we should be able to get through this stuff fairly quickly. So what exactly is memcache? Well, memcache is a memory resident uh, key value store. It's basically a replacement for the Drupal cache tables. Uh, so instead of storing everything in your MySQL database, you're storing everything in, in RAMs, which is a lot more uh, efficient and faster.
Welcome, come on, have a seat. We just get we just got started. Okay, so as I was saying, it's uh, it basically just a way of swapping out the the Drupal database cache. So you're you're hitting your uh, hitting a, a memory resident cache system rather than your database. So who uses it? Well, it turns out a lot of big people use it. It's used on Facebook, YouTube, Craigslist, a whole list. I'm not going to read through the whole list. You can uh, look them up online if you're really interested in seeing how these different companies use Memcache. Uh, Facebook is probably has one of the most complicated. Uh, Memcache installations, from what I understand, uh, it's really a, they really take, have taken the distributed nature of it to uh, quite an extreme. And there's certainly some case studies out there on the internet for what exactly they've done. So um, in your as I mentioned earlier, Memcache is just one piece of your overall performance and scalability architecture. And so your typical components here as we see is like you have a varnish or other, some other static cache on your front end. You have your web service, whether that's Apache or N Nginx, and usually have some kind of uh, opcode cache running on your, on your web service, which could be APC, uh, eAccelerator, things like that. Uh, and then we put uh, Memcache in there, which sort of runs between your web servers and your database layer. And the whole point here is that we're providing a, a sort of t offloading some of the data access responsibilities from your MySQL server to your to, the, to this caching system. So why should you use it? Well, the main point is for us is that it helps improve the scalability of of your website, and to a lesser extent, it can improve the performance of your individual page requests. And so, how does it improve your scalability? Well, it reduces the execution time of your uh, of your individual page requests, which means your server can handle more more requests in a shorter period of time. It reduces the number of queries hitting your database server, so your database server has more resources to process other requests, and it also allows you to sort of distribute out this caching aspect to other servers if you really need to scale out your your infrastructure. In some cases, you can see a, a, a page response time performance, but that is really application dependent. On a stock, like out of the box Drupal system, your users are probably aren't going to notice a, a page responsiveness improvement just by putting Memcache in. You might see like a tenth of a second improvement in your page response time. So Memcache, from our perspective, is really more of a scalability enhancement than an individual performance enhancement. So I did uh, some very rough uh, performance benchmarks and certainly take these things uh, with a huge grain of pound of salt because uh, these are some simple benchmarks I did on a single virtual machine running on my local development laptop and so they're definitely not the end all be all of it benchmarks but it gives you an idea of like what, what, how Memcache helps your system out just from a performance and scalability standpoint. So when you switch from the database, MySQL database cache to uh, using Memcache all your cache read operations, every time in your Drupal code you have a cache get, those tend to be about twice as fast going to memcache as they are going to MySQL. Uh, anytime you're doing a cache set or a cache write, those tend to be about 40% faster or 40 times faster. And on a, on a stock Drupal installation, putting memcache in place reduce the number of database queries hitting, the hitting MySQL by almost 50%. And so I can actually see down here at the bottom, I did a little bit of a benchmarking there where I wrote a little script that ran, basically updated, did 10,000 reads and 10,000 writes. And so you can sort of see here on 10,000 read operations, we, it took 3.5 seconds in my development environment with the database cache versus it took 1.5 seconds to do 10,000 reads with memcache in place. Um, on the other side, with uh, doing 10,000 writes, it took 100 seconds for uh, with the database cache versus two and a half seconds for with with memcache in place. So that's really where you where you can see a significant performance improvement if you have an an application that does a huge amount of ca uh, cache writing for a 
and then for the number of database queries, and again, it's just a stock Drupal installation. We went from 70 queries to 33 queries on just um, loading the home page of a Drupal site. And all that is just taking, getting rid of all the cache gets and cache sets to hit the database. So what are the components of a memcache system? I'm going through this way too fast, so feel free to interrupt me with questions. <laughs> so um, you need uh, basically uh, four pieces of information, four pieces. You need uh, the memcache.d daemon. This is the back-end service that runs on your server that actually does the caching. And this is a, a, a Linux process that you'll, that you'll set, set up on your system that says allocate how, 128 meg or 512 meg of RAM to use as a cache store. And, that, and so that's just sort of a background service completely outside your Drupal installation. On top of that, then you need to add a PHP extension so that PHP knows how to talk to memcache. And there's two different uh, PHP extensions available. There's the Peckle memcache, notice there's no D on it, and then there's a Peckle memcache with a D. And these are really, they both do the same thing, but they're kind of like competing uh, uh, libraries. Uh, we typically use the memcached library just because it's a little bit newer, has, has a few uh, performance optimizations in it and configure additional configuration options. And there's nothing that says you can't have both extensions on your server and you can just have just the, in your settings PHP file you can tell your Drupal site which extension that you want it to use. And we'll see that a little bit later. Uh, the next piece you need on your Drupal, oh, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, the memcached daemon, uh, can that be installed in a virtual machine? Yes. Like yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, just a Linux daemon, just like uh, uh, like an SMTP server, an NTP server, anything like that. It runs on, on the back, it's a background process that runs on Linux. So you can run it on anywhere you can run Linux. And you said you set the RAM to 128. Well, we'll get into a little bit about how you size the RAM. But you know, it, you basically think of a think of it as like kind of like setting up a RAM disk where you're allocating a certain amount of your certain amount of your RAM to be used exclusively for caching. Right. I was just going. You look at the size of all the Drupal cache tables. Yeah, that's that's where you start from. Okay, so you go over there. Yeah, we're going to be getting that in a couple slides. Uh, so the next piece you need is uh, the memcache module, which uh, tells Drupal how to talk to memcache, to your memcache server. And we'll be going through uh, some of the installation configuration steps on that here in a couple slides. And then finally you need uh, Drupal 7.9 or newer, Just and the reason why I put the caveat there on 7.9 is there was actually a bug in 7.8. And, mem and, and the current and the memcache libraries where they didn't play nice together. And so if you're using the current release of, memca of the memcache module, you want to have Drupal 7.9 or later. Uh, either that or you need uh, Pressflow 6. Or if you're running just stock Drupal 6, there's a core patch that comes with the module that you have to apply. So uh, just a quick uh, follow-up on the two different versions of the uh, PHP extension. The Peckle memcache library, it's, it's, it's the original memcache library that was released. It's uh, much, well, depends on who you talk to. It's a point of discussion, but it's a very stable uh, library. It doesn't up, get updated very frequently. It's very easy to install. You can install it on most systems with a single command. Uh, but it's not quite... It doesn't have quite as many features as the Peckle memcached extension, which has a little bit newer, updated a little more frequently, but it has a lot of dependencies that you have to get installed as well. It can be slightly faster in some cases, but I found that the performance between the two has been pretty much on par. There's they're not a whole lot of difference. But one big benefit you get with memcached is that it has uh, built-in support for the IG binary library. And does anybody, does everybody in here know what that library is? And have you heard of it? Okay, well, we're going to touch on that a little bit in a slide, but uh, so definitely uh, feel free to ask questions about that. So, what is IG binary? Um, everybody here is familiar with uh, how PHP and Drupal runs the serialized command all over the place to like convert your, your object or an array into a string of text, right? So IG binary is a replacement for that PHP serialized function. 
that instead of converting everything to text, it converts it into a binary format. So it uh, tends to be uh, slightly higher performance and uses less memory and less uh, data, data storage space. Uh, but it does take quite a bit of configuration to get in place. And not everything within Drupal supports it. Like Drupal Core doesn't actually support using IG binary, though there is a uh, issue in the issue queue for supporting that in Drupal 8. That's the very bottom link I have there. Uh, so it, it's if you have a large amounts of data that you're serializing, especially going into APC or memcache, putting IG binary on your servers can be a, a significant performance improvement. Does that include storing the serialized data into the MySQL database table? Uh, not right now. That's what the, this bottom link here for the Drupal.org issue queue is about uh, so making Drupal, uh, making Drupal uh, aware of the alternate uh, serialization libraries. It make debugging a little harder. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't have the nice uh, string that you could look at. <laughs> but you know, it's a, it's a trade-off. That's well, what sure. all things are. Thank you. Yep. So any other questions on IG binary? I don't, I don't really go into configuration of that library because I wanted to focus more on just the memcache for this piece. But I will say if you want to use IG binary with memcache, you need to get IG binary installed and configured before you compile and install memcache. Otherwise it, otherwise it doesn't link the library properly and it won't use it. So uh, how do you install it? Um, I'm going to give the example from a Debian-based system because that's what I work on mostly, but there's very similar commands for CentOS and Red Hat and other systems. So uh, the, installing the memcached daemon itself is a simple sudo apt-get install memcached. You'll, though you'll want to make sure that uh, your repos have a fairly recent version of the memcached daemon. And that is really all it takes to get mem the memcached daemon up and running. Uh, then to install one of the PHP extensions, you have to make sure you have a pair installed on your system, which uh, if you don't, you can do a app get install PHP pair. And then you can choose which one of the, the PECL extensions you want. If you just want the, the older memcache, just a sudo PECL install memcache dash beta. And the dash beta is important there because uh, the latest release of the memcache library hasn't, isn't quite classified as a production release, and so the PECO won't install it by default, so you have to put the dash beta on there. Otherwise, you get an older one, which doesn't work quite as well with Drupal. For PECO memcache, and this is where I was mentioning there's a lot of dependencies in there, you need to do make sure you do the app get, install, and you want to make sure you have libmemcache, libmemcache dev, PCRE3, and PCRE3 dev installed. Uh, then, if you want to use IG binary, do the PECL install IG binary, and there is like a, a number of steps on the on the project page for IG binary that you have to go through with uh, PHP INI settings and things like that, and some other configuration settings to get that properly configured. And then, after you get all that done, then you can finally do the PECL install memcached, which will install the memcached PHP library. And like I said, you can have both both these PECO libraries installed on your servers. They won't conflict with each other. You just have to tell Drupal which one you want it to use. Okay. Any questions on it so far? All good? So, how do you know it's working? So, uh, there's uh, several different pieces. I, I didn't go through actually installing the memcache module because we're going to touch on that a little bit later, but it's like any Drupal module. Download the module, stick it in your sites module folder, and then there's some uh, entries in the PHP in your settings PHP file, which we'll see in a moment on how to do that. So I, I want to cover all those configuration steps in, all together in a, in a couple slides. Uh, so how do you know it's working? Uh, the memcache module comes with a statistics page, which you can enable when you have the module enabled. And so one of the options it has there is a checkbox that says show memcache st statistics at the bottom of each page. And so if you have memcache properly enabled and configured, on every page load you should see at least 10 to 20 cache operations listed at the bottom of the page which are going to memcache. And it should list each of the bins which we'll talk about a little bit later. And you'll want to refresh your pages a few times and make sure that the 
the hit numbers on the operations go greater than zero. And I'll show you that here. Do a little demo. Actually, I need to turn, actually enable it before I demo it. All right, so actually, I actually already have that enabled. And so with the uh, of course when I try and demo it doesn't show the stats. No, here we can see it on the on the admin page, but basically at the very bottom here you can see that we did uh, four calls to Mentash right down there. And so that's an indication of that uh, that Memcache is doing some caching. Let me uh, clear my caches just because we should see a little bit more than that. Ah, the wonders of demos. Did your configuration edits actually get saved? Yeah, that's a good question. Usually not. Usually just clearing the caches should do it, but Yeah, we do have I do have APC running here. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not going to hang up on that, but basically you sort sort of saw the part part of that where down here at the bottom we have a uh, all the cache uh, bootstrap actions. So you're going to see on a regular page, you see 10 to 20, at least 10 or 20 lines there, listing each of the each of those items. Let's try one thing here. I have something else. Oh, uh, could be. There we go. So there you sort of see like uh, all the cash get and cash set operations. And so what you see here is like you see the different operations. These are cash gets, cash leads, and then you have different. Uh, each of these represents the different cash tables. And so you see. Every one of these is a cache get or cache set operation in your PHP code that's now going to your memcache system. And on the very far right side, you see this hit column. And what you're looking for is after, after memcache has started populating, you should see numbers here greater than one on all your get operations, which means Drupal is finding the information in memcache and pulling it from there rather than going to the database. Anytime you see a get operation with no number on it, it means that information was not in memcache and Drupal had to go to the database to, to pull that information out. Put that back on. All right, so uh, that's the, basically the steps I just showed here where you should look for the cache bin should be cache, cache menu, and cache bootstrap are the key ones that you'll definitely see listed in there. Uh, if you have other modules like views enabled, you'll see cat, like items like cache views and other, and other module dependent uh, entries as well. 
So another way you can check to see if it's working is if you have the developer module installed, you can turn on the display query log option. And with memcache enabled, you should not see any queries hitting any of the Drupal cache tables. And I can show you that here real quick. So I'm going to turn off. You generally don't want to turn on the developer module, show query log, and the memcache, show memcache statistics at the same time because you get a really messed up display. And so I, under the developer module settings, there's this option display query log, which is a really fantastic thing for a query optim for tuning your Drupal site anyway because you, you can see where, how many queries your site is running, where your slow running queries are, things along those lines. So, so if I scroll back down here, so we see, we see every query that Drupal ran to build this page. And so if we look down this list, we should, uh, basically we're looking at this far left column right here, and you should not see anything that says uh, Drupal database colon cache, cache set or cache get, if memcache is installed and working properly. The one exception to that rule, which we'll cover in just uh, just a moment, is the you'll see entries for a cache get cache set for the Drupal form cache, and we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in just a moment. So, uh, and finally, a third way you can uh, check to see if uh, memcache is working is you can use, uh, go out to the terminal and use Telnet and uh, ask mem memcache itself directly, are you working? And uh, so there's some very useful commands that you can do in, uh, with memcache. Once you're Telnet into it, you can type in stats, which will come back with some very basic statistics about what information is stored in, in uh, memcache, how, if it, how, if, how what your cache hit ratio is, how much memory has been used, things along those lines. And uh, there are a couple other items here, stat slabs. Uh, a slab is like a region of memory within memcache that it's using to allocate information. Think of it, if you're familiar with like sectors on a hard disk, it's kind of like that. It's just a, a container for storing cached information. And so memcache allocates a certain number of these bins within itself for storing information. Uh, and then stats items will display a list of all the items in memcache. Well, not, not the specific items, but uh, and how many, uh, they'll show like the sub bins and the number of items within those bins. Uh, you can run the command flush all, which will delete everything in your cache. So if you need to, uh, for some reason, flush out your cache and get some bad information in there, you can do, do that. And finally, you can do a get or a set to test actually setting, arbitrarily setting a value in memcache and then reading that value back out. And this is a good way to test if the memcache daemon itself is working. And a lot of, the, a lot of this information that, that I'm listing here from Telnet, there's actually the memcache module comes with a report that will display most of the same information within your Drupal site. So. So I'll show you the report first. There it is. Memcat, it's called Memcache Statistics. And so this will list every Memcache server that you have configured on your Drupal site, how long it's been running, how many connections it's used, how many gets and set operations it's run, how much information has been transferred, uh, how much memory, uh, how much of the RAM allocated to your memcache instance has been used. A lot of, a lot of useful statistics just for judging the, the, how well your memcache installation is working. <coughs> and then you can click on one of the individual servers to get more detailed statistics. And 
And things like uh, here, like your get get hits and get misses, are really handy for seeing if you're if you're flood, if you're not uh, getting a very high hit rate on your on your cache. Uh, and then the evictions line down here is really good to see if things are being pushed out of your cache because it's run out of memory. So if you see a lot, see basically my rule of thumb is if I see anything bigger than a zero and under evictions, I know I know I need to increase the amount, the amount of RAM that memcache is using. And I'll just show you the same thing. So if you telnet it into your memcache port and type stats, basically see the same information come back out. It's just a little bit easier to see it from within the Drupal site. But we could also go and say set for test one. I think that's the syntax. It might be a little bit. Yeah, I have to look up the syntax. But basically, you would do a. Uh, you can you can test out if the getting and setting of uh, the setting and retrieval of memcache values you can do a a set test and then you can do a, a get test one and that would verify that you're storing information in memcache and that you can pull that information back out if you have for some reason think that there's an issue with memcache losing information. Okay, all right, so that's uh, how you verify that it's working and just some very, very simple techniques for troubleshooting things. So on those important uh, memcache stats, as I mentioned before, you want to look at a hit-miss ratio of, you want to try and get as close to 99% as you can. Um, you want uh, the number of connections. I generally look for less than 1,024 active connections, but this is a configuration setting you can actually make in your memcache configuration file. And so you just want to make sure that Drupal's not trying to open more connections to your memcache server than what it's configured to allow. Otherwise, you're going to run into cases where Drupal's waiting for connections to be freed up for it to be before it can access the cache. Uh, you want to make sure that evictions line is uh, a value of zero or very, very close to that. And I generally like to look at the free, free, uh, the free memory in the memcache instance. And I, I generally like to keep it at 20% of the total memory allocated to memcache as being free. That way it can sort of has room to, to handle uh, bursts of things or unexpected events. <coughs> Each time you make another Drupal install for another website, you would have to go look at the memcache config and make top values? Yes, definitely. And uh, we're going to have to cover a configuration, another important configuration setting when you have multiple Drupal sites running on one, one memcache instance as well. So, and that's coming up here and like the next slide I think it is. You're just a little bit ahead of me on everything. <laughs> so, how do you figure out how big to make your memcache instance? And so, you know, as with all caching things, a little bit of a black art, but a good place to start is uh, look at your MySQL database and look at the total data size of all, your, of all the tables that start or are prefixed with cache. You know, I, I, so I start off with, I take the total sum of those tables. I usually double that number just for uh, good measures. And then I round it up to the nearest multiple of eight because, you know, I like keeping with the uh, 8, 16, 24, 64 meg, things like that. It just makes nice round numbers for the memcache to process. And so, for example, if you look at your cache tables and there are a total of 30 megabytes, I double that to 60 megabytes and then I would round that up to 64 meg. And that would be where I would start, set, start my memory allocation for my memcache instance. And then after you set, then from here, from there you actually will profile your system and say, am I using, a, do I have too much memory allocated, do I not have enough memory allocated, and adjust from there. But this is a good place to start.
Now, I do have a little note here that I generally try to keep my, the size of my memcache instances to under 512 megabytes. Um, there's no hard and fast rule about this. It's more of a personal preference on my point that there, there are people out there that run mem, memcache instances with multiple gigabytes of RAM. But one of my reasons for this is the way memcache sort of allocates its memory, where, we, where I mentioned the slabs before, memcache sort of like allocates memory where it starts off and I forget what the exact algorithm is, but they, they start in, create each slab as like a, a container for memory. And each the slab, so it creates them in sequence. The first slab is like a very small, it's like a, a few hundred bytes. And, but each slab after that it creates, keeps getting bigger and bigger until after, after some point you start getting into slabs where are tens of megabytes or hundreds of megabytes. And those are not as efficient as storing small pieces of information. So if you have a lot of small small bits of information being stored in the cache, it's actually quite beneficial to keep your have multiple memcache instances with a smaller total size on each one, rather than have one memcache instance with a huge amount of memory allocated to it, just from a memory memory access standpoint. And part of the reason why memcache does that is it kind of looks at the size of the information being stored into it and says. Mm -hmm. Which one of my bins is this information going to fit into best? So if you have a large piece of information, it's going to put move it towards one of the later memory segments that have more RAM allocated to it. Versus if you're just storing a key value pair, it might store it in one of the smaller segments that just has 50 bytes allocated to it. Which is, that way it's much more efficient at accessing that information. So finally, we're getting to how you configure your Drupal site. Uh, memcache comes with a whole bunch of configuration settings. Um, so I'm just going to come quickly run through uh, some of these here. The cache backend settings. This is what you, this is the setting that you use to tell Drupal that it should use an alternate caching engine from uh, the one that's built in. And this cache backend is actually the path to to a file within your memcached library uh, module. And most of these set, some of these settings are pr primarily uh, Drupal 7, but most of them are in Drupal 6, but I'm, everything here is sort of slated towards Drupal 7 in my demos. Uh, the cache default class, which is Drupal 7 specific, tells Drupal that by default use the memcache library as, as the default caching engine rather than the, the database engine that comes with Drupal. Uh, also on Drupal 7, there's this uh, setting called Drupal class, uh, cache class form. And it's really, what this is, it's the form part is actually a, a parameter. So you can actually specify on a per cache table basis uh, if you want one table to be in the database, another table to be in memcache. And so you always want to have cache class form set to be to stay in the database. And the reason for that is that if you store your uh, data, your form ca cache in, in memcache, and for whatever reason your memcache server gets reset, the, 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 you know, the entries get flushed out of it or whatever, your users going to get form errors when they try and submit their forms because the, the form will no longer exist in the cache. I've run into that and beaten my head against the wall quite a bit where I've seen that. As you know, users will typically see something like uh, form failed validation not found in cache or something like that. Not a real helpful message. Um, on Drupal 6, there you can you, there's a library that you can enable for uh, storing the, the Drupal session table in memcache. Right now, last time I checked, that library still wasn't quite stable and ready for Drupal 7. So for right now, I'm going to list that as just a Drupal 6 library, but the, it is included with the Drupal 7 module. It's just not the maintainers just haven't flagged as being ready for production use yet. Uh, the next the next setting is memcache servers, and this is where you tell your Drupal site where what what the address of your servers are at. If you it could be just one server, or it could be a hundred servers. So this is just an array, which we'll see here in just a moment. Memcache bins. This setting it has kind of mixed purposes. It used to be a, a real real important thing to set. It's not quite as important anymore. But what it allows you to do is allows you to segment different information, different uh, pieces of cached information to different uh, 
memcache server. So you can say, I want my menu cache to go to server A, I want my uh, page cache to go to server B, things like that. Uh, memcache key, key prefix. This is extremely important if you have multiple Drupal sites running off the same memcache servers. Basically what this is, every one of your, this is, this, the, whatever value is set here is prefixed on, the, on all your cache get and cache set keys. And so this prevents key uh, namespace collisions if you have multiple Drupal sites running on the same memcache. And I've definitely seen this. You see some really weird behaviors if you have uh, two Drupal sites running on the same memcache instance without having this prefix set because you'll get the setting, the, in, the cache information from, from different sites all showing up on your pages on, on, your, on, on each other's sites. So definitely, I out, whether or not I have uh, multiple Drupal sites or not, I always set this key prefix. And you'll, you'll want it to be something unique for that particular site. And then finally, the memcache options is uh, some additional configuration options if you're using the Peckle uh, memcached library. That's the memcache with the D. So, uh, on the memcached uh, options, um, the, the recommended settings here are, are the set listed up here. And basically this tells you to, uh, tells memcached that it should not use compression. Uh, what that option is, you can, and you, these are things you have to experiment with on, on a case by case basis. But com when you have the compression set to true, the memcached library will actually try to run your cache data through a compression algorithm before it's put into the cache. Uh, about the only time that's really beneficial is if you have a, a very distributed network system with maybe where you have a little bit of network latency and you want to minimize the amount of data you're sending between your servers. Otherwise, the overhead of the compression sort of negates any benefit you get from doing the compression. <laughs> um, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no problem. I'm going to turn the mic, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I have tried this and again, what everybody else has found out, it doesn't really get you anything. Yeah. Um, which I was a little disappointed. Um, but what was really, do you have any idea what the promise is supposed to be in terms of the reduction of overhead? Uh, I don't know, like, I don't know from a quantitative standpoint. Okay. You know, it's, it's, it was mostly one of those legacy things where, where if your application absolutely positively has to minimize the amount of information that it transfers between servers. For example, I did a, a state government project a few years ago where at, before they would, the state government would actually allow us to put the site online, they actually did a, a full networking stack profile of the system and said, you exceeded your bandwidth allocation for transferring between servers. And, and so in those cases, like to put it on the compression, can help, but it's not really going to give you a whole lot in, uh, in stamp from it's a only to satisfy that one metric. Yeah, and then you negatively affect the other metrics. Exactly. Did they? Well, for the government, did they kind of acknowledge that? Or? Yeah, they acknowledged it. it the, the impact was from the from the application standpoint was negligible. Right. Okay. But okay. from I, I don't remember exactly what the statistic was, but it was like uh, we weren't using the, I, the IG binary library, so everything was text. So I think we were seeing about a, like a 30% reduction in that network traffic, something like that. Okay. Uh, would the compression option reduce your RAM footprint? Yes. It, it would definitely allow you to store more information within the same space, memcache space. Yes, the compression algorithm, you may have to increase your latency. Yes. Certain pages. Yes. That may be acceptable for me. Mm -hmm. Like I said, these are things you have to experiment on a case-by-case -case yeah. basis that are very system dependent. Yeah. Uh, again, a quick follow-up. Yep. Because SSL used to be an issue, but now our, you know, our machines are so good. Yeah. It's not that. It's right. the same issue that it was before. Exactly. Um, and I am very curious if, you, if your thought, have you thought of, well, where is the intersect point of where our technology needs to kind of be to allow everybody to turn it on blindly uh -huh. and really benefit from it and not, you know, hurt uh. someone else? Did you, did, you, did you ever go down that thought process? I haven't. You know, it's so, it's so hard to judge, you know, because it's, it's so application dependent as well. You know, like most, most, most modern web servers, you know, you get like a, a quad or six or eight processor web server up there, it's going to be able to handle the compression with probably not even noticing the effort. But if you have a lot of right. complex processing logic in there, then that, you know, that extra 50 nanoseconds is going to really add up.
Do you think this is something left over from dial-up? <laughs> I don't know about dial-up, but it's definitely an older, <laughs> older <laughs> set. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, 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 okay. I oh, no problem. All right, so uh, the next option here is the op, op distribution. And there's really two, two options there, distribution consistent and distribution modula. And in almost all cases, you want to use distribution consistent. And what this, what this is, this is the algorithm that Memcache uses to determine which server it's going to store a particular piece of information on. Because by I kind of I probably should have put a slide in there about this, but the way mem, if you have multiple webs multiple memcache servers, memcache will actually has a little hashing algorithm that it uses that looks at your key name and creates a like a, a an index key hash off of that that then it then routes to different servers. So key A may go on server B, server one, and key B may go on server three, and it's based on the key name. And so this is the algorithm that that sort of determines that. So, which is a very important point. Out of the box, memcache is, does not do any replications. If you have two servers, those, those two servers will not store, have the same information on them. When you use the um, non-consistent No, any. Any? Any. Yeah, well, when we talk to, the, when we look at the multi-server configuration, I'll touch on that a little bit more. Was there a question back there? No. Okay. And then finally, the option uh, binary protocol. Um, this is a, high, a more efficient uh, protocol for, for the PHP to talk to the memcache library. The, if you set this to false, PHP is going to be basically talking to memcache over a telnet, running telnet commands. If you set it to true, it's going to use a much more efficient uh, binary, binary, direct binary communication with the server, which is uh, higher, higher performing and less, less memory. Um, if you only if you are only running a single memcache server, though, if you set your distribution to modula, you do see about a ten to per, ten to twenty percent fast improvement on performance, just because the hashing the algorithm for figuring out the distribution is simpler. Have you even found this also with VMs even on VMs? Yeah. VMs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and my, my, actually, my ten to twenty percent number came from my doing that on a VM. Excellent. Yeah. And like I said, these are only valid if you're using the Peckle memcached library, not, not the original memcached library. So, out of the box, memcache has a few very important limitations that you need to be aware of. First one is the max key size. And actually, this is also true of Drupal itself, is that uh, the max key size on your, you know, where you do your cache get in a key name or a cache set in a key name is 250 bytes. If you go have a key size over 250 bytes, that key is run through an MD5 hashing algorithm before it's before it's sent to the before it's sent. And so, keep your keys under under 250 bytes to just avoid that hashing penalty. Um, the default installation of memcache that you run that you get when you do the app get install memcache is compiled with a with a max data size of one megabyte. So no, none of your cache keys can store anything more than one megabyte of information in, in a single key. You can manually recompile memcache to change that setting if you need to. Though I honestly I've never had to. And the the other important keys here though which that I touched on just a moment ago, there is no redundancy or locking in, in memcache. It's it's just there assumes that any kind of locking or redundancy is handled on the application side. And so that means that information is not shared between different memcache servers. And so if you lose a memcache server, you're going to lose all the information in that cache. But not what like other caches will keep their information, but it won't be the same information. So um, trying, I wish I wish I would have done a diagram of this, but basically because the, the algorithm memcache uses is based on the keys. It does a sort of a calculation that turns those keys into a into a code that then maps to an array index of your server. So if you have key if you have a key key A would map to server one, key B would map to server two, key C might map to server two, and so forth. And so you, it sort of like tries to split up the key key assignments between the different servers. 
And so that's an important thing when you're also sizing if you're having multiple servers is you don't have to, if, you, if you're splitting things up, if you've looked at your cache tables and think, okay, I need 64 mega RAM for storing all my cache information, but I'm going to have two memcache servers, you only need 32 mega RAM per cache server because that's, your keys are going to be split up between those two servers. Yeah. Um, the memcache uh, flush all command, mm -hmm. does that force everything to write to MySQL? No. No, it just deletes it out of the cache. So is there any way to force it to write to MySQL when you want to turn off memcache D? No. I'm sure somebody's probably come up with an extension to do that, but out of the box, no. Yeah. And you know, if you turn off memcache, you just, you're going to lose your cache, Drupal's going to go back, fetch everything from the database, and store it back into the Drupal database caches. You know. Yeah, but the database at that point will be stale. Well, it's going to, the, the cache tables will all be empty in the database anyway, so it's going to go grab everything, re, grab everything, refresh, and then repopulate the database. Okay, you had a question? Yeah, you were saying that it's a, uh, it picks the on the keys to you if we're running into an issue where uh, the load between the two memcache servers is not symmetrical, one of it's taking like a heavier load than the other because the operand just feels like that's the way it should be. Um, yeah, that's, I haven't seen a whole lot of that, but you do see a little bit of a mismatch of loads sometimes because uh, it, it's not... But it's not usually a problem? It's not usually a huge problem, no. Yeah, I'm not gonna say it's not it's not as smooth as like a round robin approach because it really depends on like the text of your keys and I, I haven't dug into the exact algorithm that they use for figuring that out. Okay. Um, on this uh, final note here on the no redundancy or locking though, there are extensions to memcache to the memcache daemon that you can add to set up replication between memcache instances, and so you can sort of get that consistency between multiple memcache servers. I haven't bothered setting that up. I really haven't needed it, but that is out there if that is a requirement for your system. So, let's see, we have, oh boy, I have about 10 minutes left, so let's see if I can get through these configuration things pretty quickly. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, three real quick uh, configuration strategies, a very basic, uh, simple configuration with one memcache server. A uh, basic configuration where we have two memcache servers that are co-located on like your web servers, and then finally a multiple di bin distributed configuration. So very basic configuration, we, which I find is good for uh, smaller websites that run on web, one or two web servers. Your content is mostly read only, not not frequently changing. And in this case, I would put memcache on the MySQL server. And so this is what your, your settings PHP file would look, at, look like. And so the, the first line up here, cache backends, this is where you tell Drupal what file contains the memcache libraries, so, it, so Drupal knows how to talk to memcache. The default class just tells Drupal that's the library that you want to use for caching. Uh, there you're seeing we're telling the, the cache to use the database cache for forms. And here's the important piece right here, memcache services. So what, what is the address of the server that we want to, that, that memcache is running on? And the important thing here is you always want to use some kind of DNS name for that. Because especially if you have a, a multiple web servers, you want th this name has to be the same on every web server that's talking, talking to that memcache bin. And so this, uh, there's actually two aspects to this. One is the address of the server, and the next is a, uh, a name for that server or a group of servers. And you always want your first one to be called default. All right. uh, the next line there is the memcache key, key prefix I mentioned earlier. Just come up with some random text that you want to prefix your, your, key, your keys with. And then uh, your memcache options. And since this is only a single memcache instance, we can do modular A, which is slightly more performant. Okay. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. So, uh, simple distributed configuration. 
This is good for sites running on two or more web servers. And I find it's really better for if you have a little bit more of a mix of read-only and regularly changing content. Uh, in this case, I put an instance of memcache on each of the web servers. And so it sort of distributes the caching workload between your two web servers rather than putting it all in your database server in this configuration. The downside of this is if one of your web servers go down, you lose half your caching capacity. So uh, here's your PHP, uh, our settings PHP file. And the only things we're changing here is the servers, we're listing two servers now instead of just one. And we changed the distribution option to be distribution consistent. And again, you want those server names to be identical across all your Drupal heads, all your Drupal web servers. And the, the reason behind that is that the, the server names is actually goes into the hashing algorithm to figure out where a key is stored. So if you have different server name, if you have different names in those uh, settings files, you'll actually get keys stored from your, your different web servers stored on different uh, memcache servers. And so you can get some uh, inconsistency in your caching. Okay. Uh, and then the third one is uh, if you're really looking to sort of scale things out, you, you have, actually have dedicated servers just for handling memcache. And a lot of times I'll start off with like these would just be very low end virtual machines where I'll just put one CPU core on and throw a gig, two gig of RAM, a gig or two gig of RAM on each one of those servers. And because they don't need a whole lot of processing capability. They need almost no disk space, but, but they need a lot of RAM. And you can expand this out to any number of servers that you might need. I, and this is an approach I take if, you, if I have a high traffic website that has frequently changing content, especially like if you have a lot of user generated content. This is a strategy I will use a lot of times. And so uh, here's our settings PHP file. And you see here, uh, I'm also talking about covering a little bit, combining another aspect here of doing multiple bins. So here we have uh, two servers for uh, our default cache, and then I'm also storing uh, some information in a separate uh, third server, which I'm calling just the static cache. And the idea being here is, as your site scales out, storing everything in one cache is, does not make the most sense, because you have some information that almost never changes, like your menu structures or some of your path tables, things like that. And so move that information out into a, into a smaller cache that's just dedicated to that read-only content that very rarely changes, and then have another cache that handles all your changing information. And then down here below, we have the main cache bins where we're saying, by default, we're storing everything in the default bin. But then we're storing things like the bootstrap, the menu, uh, the, the field cache, the filter cache, and the path cache in that static cache. And you can really take this out. You can basically look, these uh, prefixes that you see here, the cache, cache bootstrap, these all map to the cache tables that you'll see in the MySQL database. And so you can take every one of your cache tables and put them to a separate cluster of uh, memcache servers. And so also another point here is if you look up here, I have two servers listed as default. And so this, so the default bin will, will serve alternate between the two servers. Whereas uh, the, everything just flat and static will always go to just that one server. And so you, you can make, you can come up with some really complicated configurations if you need to, where you can have clusters of clusters of servers if you, if you need to scale to that level. Okay. Make sense to everyone? So a uh, few other tips, and then we're uh, just about done and right on time, it looks like. So uh, within Drupal, on the performance page, you have an option there for minimum cache lifetime. If you're using memcache, you do not want to set that. There's like some kind of weird bug that if you set, that, if you set the minimum cache lifetime, memcache will never flush anything. <laughs> Uh, another important thing is on the on the, ma on the cache expiration time or the max lifetime, don't set that to be more than 30 days. And the reason for that is the way memcache stores its internal pointers for the information, 
the 30-day mark is actually by default Memcast stores like the, the uh, time from now, but after 30 days it sort of switches to absolute date. <laughs> and so if you put like a cash expiration time of 31 days, you'll get like a cash expiration of like 31 days after like 1978. <laughs> and so your cash will always expire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, you, you don't actually have to have the memcache module in, enabled on your Drupal site. All you have to have is this lot, this cache backends line in your in your settings PHP file, and that's all you absolutely that's all you have to have enabled in your Drupal site. If you enable the the, the memcache module, that just gives you a, an administrative report, so you can check your memcache statistics, and it gives you the option of showing your memcache info at the bottom of the page. That's all that module does. Um, if you're going if you're gonna have to find multiple bins, you, where we, we're seeing here with the with the multiple bins, always make sure you define at least one bin to be default. If you don't, and you go to like the memcache report, you're gonna see some weird errors about not being able to find things, and your in the report won't work correctly. Internally, everything will still work fine if you don't do that, but it's just you'll get some weird errors on your Drupal site. Um, the strategy I use for like figuring out what how I'm going to split out content is if I'm if I'm progressing from one memcache server to multiple memcache servers and multiple bins, I'll first move out all my static read-only content like menus, the bootstrap, uh, things like that. Then I'll look at moving out the page cache, and then I'll move out then I'll move out uh, the high traffic caches such as the, your session or, or, or general cache table, the things that you might get a high number of flushes on. So that's kind of like the sequence of that I would break things out. And that is it. I have a whole bunch of references here, which I'm going to upload, the, up the, upload this latest slide to the website here as soon as we're done. Um, but one important thing, which I'm not, I didn't cover here in the configuration, though, but uh, this, this bottom link, there's a really nice uh, Linux shell script there that can replace your uh, script, the memcache script in, in the init D folder to make it easy to launch uh, multiple uh, memcache instances on your server. It basically uh, will look at a, a sysconfig folder and you can just put a separate file in there with, uh, with configuration settings for every memcache instance and it will automatically launch all those instances for you. All right, and that is all I had. Any, uh, any other questions before we take off? Uh, oh, the settings code? Right, right. Yeah. So, so this code right here? Yeah, this is basically the same code I was showing up there on the slides. So basically, this first line, cache back in, this just tells Drupal what file contains the, the memcache library. Uh, the next line, the default cl class, tells Drupal what's the, what's the name of the library that, to instantiate for caching. Uh, this next line, cache class form, we're telling Drupal not to, not to cache the form, to use the database cache for caching form data. Uh, this memcache extension, if you have multiple memcache in libraries, you can use this to switch between memcache and memcache D for the library. And then you have the different servers and bins, and then your configuration options. Okay? Great. Thank you, everyone. Closing oh, everything down because uh, 
We definitely want to have that on. Yeah. Uh, Give a reminder. You don't want to hit the cancel button while it's going to get like I did. <laughs> Going back and reviewing the slides. Are you going to put all the slides up? Yeah, I'm going to upload the entire presentation. Awesome. I got to email you.